Welcome to confirmation in our study uh, of the Ten Commandments. And we're obviously going to start off with the uh, first commandment, which is you shall have no other gods. And what's important about this one especially is that all of the other nine commandments all flow directly back into this one. If you break any of the others, you're breaking this one. So God puts this, this first for a reason. He says this is the primary, most important Thing. Um, and I kind of want to unpack that a little bit today uh, so that we really see what the importance is of not having other gods. Uh, there's a quote by A.W. Tozer uh, that will help kind of guide us as we study this, this first commandment and ultimately all ten commandments. Um, he says that what comes to your mind when you think about who is God is the most important thing about you. What comes to your mind when you think about who is God is actually the most important thing about you. It's not or where you work or uh, how good you are in school or who your family is or how old you are or how young you are or how healthy you are or whatever. That's not the most important thing about you. It's what comes to your mind when you think of who is God. Because ultimately, when you your answer to that question of who is God really dictates what you do and how you live and, and ultimately where you find your purpose and your meaning and your drive for this life. Let's, let's give a couple examples. Um, if you think that God is just this a grandfather figure who, who's really nice and he doesn't really care about what you do, that's going to dictate how you live. You're not going to care about his Ten Commandments or really anything he says for that matter because it doesn't really matter. He's going to j- just... Uh, really forgive you anyway. Because he's just a nice grandfather and he doesn't really care what anyone does. So you're not going to want to witness to other people because it doesn't matter. You're not going to want to obey his commandments because it doesn't matter. Now, on the flip side, if you see God as a as a loving, caring, all-knowing father, then you see his commandments, his commands as not just a list of rules that you need to follow in order to be good. But if he's loving and he's all-knowing, then he might he's given us these rules. He's given us these guidelines to protect us. And that this is actually the best plan for our life. So what comes to your mind when you think of who is God is the most important thing about you. And so this is why the first commandment is so important. Because whoever your God is, that defines your life. That defines what you do, that defines how you act, that defines where you go, that defines where you use uh, the gifts that you have. And so if your God is wealth, you will do everything in your life will be geared towards getting more of that. If your God is athletic success, Everything in your life is geared towards that. It's not just about having this first on the list. It's about what's at the center of everything on your list. You know, for, for people that, that spend time, uh, so much time at work, and so work's clearly number one for them, um, and, and, but even when they're at home, they're thinking about work. Uh, when they're on vacation, they're thinking about work. Work is the center of everything that they do. Therefore, work is their God. And so the, the God, as revealed in Scripture, says, you shall have no other gods. This, this word, no, if you look back in the original text, literally means no. There, there's no option. Uh, it's, it's no, none, zero. Not just, well, God's first on your list, and then there's a bunch of other gods that are controlling you. No, no, it's no gods. Because you have one God. The God as revealed in Scripture that loves you and cares for you and that died for you. That is your one God, and you don't need anything else. This is why the first commandment is so important. Now, if you should have no other gods, we've got to look at what then is a God. Is a God just like a little statue that... Uh, you, you put up in your house somewhere because I mean we all might have something like that in our basement. We call it, you know, an, an antique or something. But oh, do we need to get rid of those? 
Because um, once we do that, then we'll have no other gods, and that's fine. But we're not let off the hook that easy. Because a god isn't just a little statue that you bow, literally bow down and worship. A god is whatever you put your, your trust in. is whatever you look for for security. And that when, when a life gets hard, when things go bad, that's where you turn in times of distress. Whatever answers those questions, whatever has those qualities, that is your God. And the problem is, is that we're constantly finding other things than the God uh, revealed in Scripture to worship. We're finding other things to trust. We're finding other things to find your security in. In fact, uh, C.S. Lewis, a famous uh, Christian author, uh, he, he writes that our hearts are idol-making factories. They're constantly in the business of making new idols. And so this first commandment is so hard for us. It's such a big deal for us. Um, it's because we constantly are making our own idols. We're constantly trying to find our own way. And yet, what God do you worship, what, what God that you are focused on, where you find your security, actually really matters. And when we look at the other gods in this world that we have created on our own, that our hearts have, have fashioned out of our, our idol-making factory, we see that they simply aren't worthy of worship. They can't provide us security. And ultimately, they leave us with nothing. So let's look at a, a couple examples of common ones that, that in today's culture that we tend to make our own gods out of. Uh, the first one is, is, is work. Work is a good thing. Work was given to us by God. It was given to Adam uh, even before the fall. He, that he was to work the garden. Work is a good thing. And yet, when it becomes the ultimate thing, when it becomes not just well, the most time you spend in us, but it's everything else in your life flows back into it, that it's your source of identity that that you're constantly seeking uh, more promotion, more, more wealth, and that, that's the driving force behind everything that you do to the expense of, uh, of your, your religion, to the expense of your family, to the expense of everything else in your life. That is your God. And ultimately, work changes. People lose jobs. The market's crashing. So when that happens, if that's your God, you're left with nothing. How about, uh, for, for young people today, how about sports? Is that sports, tend, they take up so much time, they take up uh, so much energy, and, and yet they're, they're a good activity. It's a good way to, to use the bodies that God has given us. But if that becomes our, our source of identity, our, our focus of life, is that everything goes towards, well, I need to, to do well with the sports so I can go on a college scholarship, so that I can become professional, so that... Uh, I, I can retire and be famous. You know, it, that, that track of life that so many people are, are looking towards, whether they have the skills or not. And yet, injuries happen. Uh, sometimes we don't always make the team. Our team doesn't always do well, even if we're on it. We don't seem to, we can't practice quite hard enough to make it to the next level. And so when that happens, then we are left with nothing. Relationships is another area that we tend to make gods out of. Um, relationships, again, they're a good blessing from God. Yeah, specifically, the marriage relationship, God says, this is meant to mirror my relationship with the church. It's a good thing. It's set up by God. And yet, if that other person, if another person becomes your God, if they become the person that, that God completes you, um, as, as so many uh Movies and different media outlets will tell you that you got to find the, the, that one person that completes you that was made perfectly to complement you. Um, then, when you find out that, that they aren't perfect, that they don't complement you perfectly, that they're they're not the person that completes you, then your whole world crumbles. So we find out that, that having someone else be your number one, be the center of everything, it, we make terrible gods. You can't trust in another sinful person to be the center of everything in your life, whether it's a dating relationship, a marriage relationship, 
a, a friendship, even a, a, a parent-child relationship. Those are good things, but they are not the ultimate thing. Um, a number of people in our society, whether it's uh, high school or college, even a, a lot of adults, um, they turn, uh, after they've had a really long day, a hard time, they, they turn to alcohol as their source of, of security, as their release. And so whether they realize it or not, whether it's an everyday occurrence or not, that is it's becoming their God. It, it's where they turn when life gets hard. Where, where they turn to uh, just ignore what's going on in their life. And, and it becomes an, an escape for them. Um, and so that has actually become their God. And so you see how these different things that, that we fashioned into gods in our own liking, in our own image, none of them actually fix anything. None of them actually are, are long-term solutions. None of them actually offer us anything more than brokenness. Let's return to the commandment. You shall have no other gods. This isn't just a statement about how jealous our God is now. He wants us to worship Him and Him alone. That is true. But it's also Him saying, you're not going to find this anywhere else. You're not going to find security. You're not going to find safety. You're not going to find identity. You're not going to find purpose anywhere else outside of a relationship with me. This is God declaring how self-sufficient He is. So if we have Him, we have everything. If we have Christ, if we have God, if we have that relationship, if we're clinging to Him, we have everything that we need. And so th this first commandment is not just a command to say, hey, you need to do this. It's, it's a plea from a loving father to his children saying, stop looking other places for things that they can't offer. When you need something good, come to me. Come to me, and, and I will give it to you. I will provide, but I will take care of you. When, when things seem to be falling apart, when you don't know where to turn, come to me. Cling to me, and I will carry through whatever comes your way. I am the Lord, your God. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I have adopted you as my child. My son died for you, and I give you everything that you need. This is our God. We can't find that anywhere else. You shall have no other gods. God's blessings on your, your family discussion, as you're, you're wrestling with um, what God's tend to creep up in our lives, as you're learning more about who is this God revealed in the Scripture, and why should we fear God? love, and trust in Him above all things. And I pray that as, as you do that, you may encourage one another as a family um, to, to seek after, after the one true God. And that you would remind each other that if you have God, we have everything. Because He's the one that gives all good gifts. He gives us everything that we need to support this body and life. Thanks be to Him for all his good gifts. And I hope that as you discuss, you remind yourself of that, you dig into that, and you grow together in a relationship with the one true God as a family.